my name, but who are you? Just another American who saw too many movies as a child. Another orphan of a bankrupt culture who thinks he's John Wayne, Rambo, Marshall Dillon. I was always kind of partial to Roy Rogers, actually. It's okay, I'm a cop. So are you lady live out here? About the past six months. Meaning you still live in New York? You always ask us many questions, Argyle. <laughs> Is Daddy coming home, Sue? Well, we'll see what Santa and Mommy can do, okay? So if it doesn't work out, man, you got a place to stay? I'll find a place. Looking for... Uh, oh, yeah. Then you must be John McClain. This one did you start using Ms. Gennaro. It's a Japanese company. They figure a married woman's got You are a married woman, Holly. You're married to no, me. We're gonna have this Remember, conversation again. We did this in July. <laughs> Are in charge. Welcome to the party, pal. Come the fuck down here and arrest me. Just send the police now. John can drive somebody that crazy. Uh. <laughs> Do you really think you have a chance against us, Mr. Cowboy? Yippee-ki-yay, motherfucker. Hey, Roy, how you feeling? Pretty fucking unappreciated, Al. The 20th of July 1988, Die Hard hit the big screen in the USA and was a huge hit. It didn't arrive in the UK till seven months later in early February of 1989. Produced for $28 million, it managed to rake in $141 million worldwide. Directed by John McTiernan, who had success the year before with Predator, directs Bruce Willis in his career-defining role. The success of this movie kick-started a franchise, which over the years spawned four sequels. The film also introduced us to the late Alan Rickman, who blew audiences away with his performance, making him one of the most popular villains of cinema. Die Hard is now considered one of the best action films of the 80s. Its formula has been copied a number of times, such as the examples of Under Siege and Sudden Death. And of course, it's a firm favourite for Christmas viewing. Just recently, Bruce Willis declared it wasn't a Christmas film. This may be his honest opinion, or just saying it to wind people up. In 1988, the reviews were mixed. Roger Ebert gave it two stars and felt the deputy police officer ruined the movie, saying the character is so willfully useless, so dumb, so much a product of the idiot plot syndrome that all by himself he successfully undermines the last half of the movie. The Washington Post felt the movie manipulated its audience and the script is a monument to illogic. The critics felt it was a yell participation movie with a few laughs along the way. Now opinions on the film shifted quickly into the positive and many of the elements that weren't addressed at the time have been highly praised and its level of filmmaking and storytelling has been given the respect it deserves. In 1968, 20th Century Fox produced the successful film The Detective, starring Frank Sinatra. The film was based on the book by Roderick Thorpe. He wrote a sequel in 1979 called Nothing Lasts Forever, taking inspiration from the film The Towering Inferno. The story was about Sinatra's character, a New York police detective called Joe Leland, visiting the 40-story office headquarters of the Claxton Oil Corporation in LA on Christmas Eve, where his daughter Stephanie Gennaro works. 
While he is waiting for his daughter's Christmas party to end, a group of German terrorists take over the skyscraper. The studio had wanted to adapt the book for the big screen, but as Sinatra was contracted to appear in the sequel, he had to be offered the part, but being in his early 70s he turned the part down, which is what they had hoped. There were rumours floating around for years that Die Hard was a repurposed script for the intended sequel to Commando, but that was not true. You can find interviews with Stephen E. D'Souza explaining what he wrote for the sequel and its false connection to Die Hard. With Sinatra no longer involved, it gave them the opportunity to change the characters and remove the connection to the detective. With Joel Silver producing, he had worked with director John McTiernan the year before on Predator and wanted him to direct it, but John didn't really like the early drafts of the script and turned the offer down multiple times. He revealed in the commentary to the movie that he took some persuasion to direct it. He felt the script was too mean and he wanted to lighten it up and add some humour. He didn't want forced humour, but make it a tad more joyful, so he didn't hate the villains when they were on camera. You would end up enjoying their scenes. McTiernan didn't want the villains to be terrorists either, considering that direction too nasty for a summer movie. He chose to avoid the terrorists' politics in favour of making them thieves in pursuit of monetary gain, believing it would make the film more suitable for popcorn entertainment. For the cast, we have Bruce Willis as John McClane. Willis was largely known for his comedic role as Detective David Addison on the television series Moonlighting, and the studio did not believe at first in his action star appeal. The script was initially offered to a variety of popular stars, including Sylvester Stallone, Harrison Ford, Don Johnson, Richard Gere, and even Clint Eastwood, but they all turned it down. Bruce saw the opportunity and took the part, and ended up getting paid $5 million to star in the film a figure virtually unheard of at the time for an actor who had starred in only two moderately successful films and came from TV. Once on board, McTiernan and Willis decided to change the character of John McClane to a person who did not like himself very much, but was doing the best he could in a bad situation. Thus the character became more sympathetic and made him more of an everyday man who the audience could relate to. The late Alan Rickman plays Hans Gruber. This would be Alan's first feature film role. Alan had a wealth of experience of acting in theatre and came to the attention of the producers who had seen him perform on stage. Hans Gruber is a German mastermind and the leader of the professional thieves posing as terrorists. Bonnie Bedelia plays Holly Gennaro McLean, John's estranged wife who moved to LA to start a new career. Bonnie had worked in TV and movies for years since the early 70s and more recently starred in the long-running series Parenthood. She did return for Die Hard 2. Alexander Goodenough, who sadly passed away at the young age of 45, plays Carl, Hans' main henchman. Alexander was also known for his performance in the Harrison Ford film Witness. Reginald Vale Johnson plays Sergeant Al Powell. It's revealed Powell works in the office of a police station after taking himself off the street, after accidentally shooting a child who he believed had a gun and has struggled to live with this mistake. His character returns for Die Hard 2, but only for a brief cameo. The late Paul Gleason plays Dwayne T. Robinson, the deputy chief of police who turns up at the siege and makes a mess of the operation, thinking he knows what he is doing. Paul is probably most fondly remembered for his performance as the headmaster in The Breakfast Club. Devereux White plays Argyle, John's limousine driver. He waits around for John in the plaza car park and is unaware of the chaos that unfolds. Devereux had a staggered acting career. He made his first film appearance in The Blues Brothers. The same year of Die Hard, he also starred in Action Jackson. William Atherton plays Richard Thornburg, an arrogant reporter who will do anything to get a story and the attention he so craves. He returned for Die Hard 2, but was most famous for his role in Ghostbusters. Hart Buckner plays the traditional 80s yuppie Harry Ellis, a sleazy Nakatomi executive. Hart was the son of famous actor Lloyd Buckner, who had starred in The Detective. Hart moved into directing, but did continue acting on and off. He first came to my attention as the love interest in Supergirl the movie. The late James Shigeta plays Joseph Takagi, Nakatomi's head executive. James had been acting since the late 50s and starred in dozens of popular TV shows. And finally we have Robert Darby and Grand L. Bush appearing as FBI special agents Big and Little Johnson. As a kid I loved seeing Robert in Goonies and he was a brilliant villain in License to Kill. Grand L. Bush also popped up in License to Kill and that year had a role in Lethal Weapon 2. But he would always be Borog to me from Street Fighter the movie. Filming began in early November of 1987 and finished in March of 1988, 
The corporate headquarters of 20th Century Fox to Fox Plaza in Century City serves as the film setting for both external and internal scenes. At the time of filming, the building was still under construction and a setting for a scene of McLean exploring an unfinished floor complete with construction equipment was real. The building became so iconic due to the film that security over the years had to clamp down on people posing outside it to take photos. The end helicopter scene took six months of preparation and the production was given only two hours in which to film it. It took them three attempts above Fox Plaza to get what they needed. The script went through many changes during the shooting process and at one point they didn't know how to end it. The shooting script did not originally include the meeting between McLean and Gruber, pretending to be a hostage. It was only written in when it was discovered that Rickman could perform an American accent. John McTiernan later on thought differently on his accent and felt it should have been dubbed over. Me personally, I don't think it's Alan's finest accent. The film opens with New York detective John McClane arriving in LA on Christmas Eve to attend a party, intending to reconcile with his estranged wife Holly, meeting her at her employer's head office, the Nakatomi Corporation. Limousine driver Argyle drops off McClane at the party. Argyle decides to wait around for John if the catch up with his wife turns sour. John meets with his wife and she is happy to see him, but soon the frictions between them begin to start. Holly leaves to make a speech and John gets cleaned up for the party. At the entrance, the security guard is taken out and the building is put into lockdown. The elevator on the floor of the party opens and professional thief Hans Gruber and his team take control. John hears gunfire and quickly slips away avoiding detection as everyone is held hostage. Gruber is looking for Takagi, who he discovers in the crowd and takes him to his office and interrogates him for the code to the building's vault. He plans to steal $640 million in bearer bonds, using terrorism merely as a distraction. McLean is secretly following Gruber and Takagi, watching them from a distance. Takagi refuses to cooperate and is killed by Gruber. John needs to alert the authorities and sets off a fire alarm so Gruber sends one of his henchmen to investigate. He and John face off and get into a brawl, resulting in the henchman having his neck broken. John takes his weapon and radio, using it to contact the LAPD. Sergeant Al Powell is sent to investigate, as he is the only cop nearby. McLean sends Gruber's man down the elevator, alerting the group that he now has a machine gun. So Gruber sends Henrik and Marco to stop McLean. They both fail to do so. Powell arrives and finds nothing unusual. Powell prepares to leave, but McLean attempts to get Powell's attention and drops one of the dead bodies on his patrol car. Powell panics and summons the LAPD, who quickly turn up and lay siege to the building. McLean is now stuck with dealing with Gruber and his team, and the police outside not willing to help him and fail to appreciate his efforts with only Powell on his side. The visual effects for Die Hard were handled by Richard Edlund's company, Boss Film. This company was set up a few years earlier, after he left George Lucas's FX company, Industrial Light and Magic. Boss Film's first big projects were Ghostbusters and 2010, which garnered them Academy Award nominations and proved they were a strong competitor to ILM. The effects in Die Hard really come into play during the attack on the police outside the plaza, the explosion of the C4 by McLean, the big finale as the roof explodes, and the death of Gruber. The explosions were enhanced optically with additional explosions and smoke effects, and a false perspective miniature for example for the elevator shaft as the C4 strapped to a chair is dropped down to take out the floors below. The most memorable effect is the film's dramatic climax, the explosion of the roof of the Nakatomi building. Boss again composited various shots of explosions with a mix of miniatures, pyrotechnics and high speed photography. For Hans Gruber's slow motion plummet from the tower, Rickman performed the stunt himself and dropped 40 feet. The shot used was the first take. Rickman was dropped sooner than he had been told he would be, so the look of fear on his face is genuine. This was all done before digital compositing, and done the old fashioned way shot on 65mm film, so the resolution is very high, and you lose less detail when optically printing all the elements for the final shot. Die Hard exhibits some of the best optical work before everything went digital come the 90s. The late composer Michael Kamen provides a score to Die Hard. Michael, who sadly passed away in 2003, was a popular choice of composer during the 80s and on into the 90s. Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, most commonly known as Ode to Joy, is featured prominently in Michael Kamen's score throughout the film. 
The director incorporated these themes into the film's soundtrack as a homage to Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange and in keeping that sense of joy he wanted added to the movie and the music does complement that. Kamen would often use thematic variations on well-known pieces of classical music. He did a similar thing in Terry Gilliam's Brazil. The score did come under extensive editing, with music samples looped over and over and cues added to scenes. For example, cues from other scenes were reused again and adjusted to fit the rhythm of the edit, changing a lot of what Kamen originally wrote for a specific scene. This is not uncommon and happens a lot with film music, as the director wants changes made at the last minute. Kamen's work for Die Hard 2 and 3 came under far less adjusting and most of his material remained intact and how he intended it. As the film has a Christmas setting, the score also features sleigh bells in some of the cues, as well as the Christmas song Winter Wonderland. The 1987 rap song Christmas in Hollies, performed by Run DMC, was used near the beginning and the end credits of the film begin with the Christmas song Let It Snow. Die Hard does include two temporary tracks of music by other composers. These pieces may have been put in during the rough cut to create a temp track, or a decision was made to include them because Kamen's material didn't quite work for the studio and director. These pieces of music are heard near the end when McLean and Powell see each other for the first time. This is taken from John Scott's score for the 1987 film Man on Fire, and for the surprise return of Carl at the end, and we see him get shot by Powell, this piece of music is from James Horner's Aliens. I'm a big fan of Michael Kamen's work, and I own a bunch of his scores, and Die Hard is certainly up there as one of his most memorable. Once you hear those themes, you know instantly it's from Die Hard. Kamen had a great skill at mixing classical pieces of music with his own style effortlessly. My favourite piece is easily the rooftop scene as the music builds up to this inevitable explosion, with McLean jumping for his life, and the more emotional moments when he tells Powell the mistakes he's made with his relationship with his wife. I think as a soundtrack to listen to by itself, it often doesn't make my playlist, because as an album it doesn't quite work as well. A score is designed primarily for a movie first, then as an album it's a second option, but I think his scores to say Highlander and Robin Hood Prince of Thieves are strong contenders for easy listening, and work really well independently from the film. The film never received a soundtrack release at the time on LP and CD. It's unclear why it didn't have one, maybe a result of not having a new song attached to it, or the lack of a market for it at the time. It wasn't until 2002 that it finally got released and was limited to 3,000 copies. These were grabbed straight away and it sold out fast. Fans who missed out had to wait till 2011 for another print run, but yet again copies were grabbed quickly. But thankfully last year they re-released it again and it's still available to purchase at $24.98. For once I can talk about a score for an old movie that's actually available to buy. Die Hard arrived at a time when video games based on movies were starting to become very common, especially if you owned a 8-bit microcomputer. A number of games were released at the time for the Commodore 64, PC Engine, MS-DOS and the most common title for the Nintendo Entertainment System. The Commodore 64 version has some nice graphics for the time considering the computer's limitations. The controls take some getting used to however, with way too many commands to pick up and access items. The floors of the plaza end up turning into a maze of rooms as you navigate your way through them. It stays very faithful to the movie, as you have to collect items to complete certain missions, like you can't go in the air duct without your lighter, and you need to pick up certain items to make a bomb. You only get one life, so if you die, you go back to the beginning of the game. With so many hit and miss movie game tie-ins, this one is surprisingly good for the old Commodore. The MS-DOS version is an early attempt at a third-person action game. Very primitive by today's standards, but very ambitious for the time. Published by Activision and developed by Dynamix, it received strong reviews when it came out. No idea why. To be honest, this is the first time I've come across this version. The game is pretty tough and has a terrible combat system, making for a frustrating experience. If you can get your head around the combat and how it plays, you may get some enjoyment out of it, but it certainly wasn't my cup of tea. The NES game, like the C64 title, is a surprisingly faithful game to the movie. Following the plot closely, it has dedicated cutscenes, you can hear radio chatter from Hans Gruber, and even the glass can hurt your feet like in the film. There are 40 terrorists scattered throughout the building, and John McClane's task is to clear each floor of terrorists of floors 31 to 35. From the beginning, McClane has only a pistol and the use of his fists to dispose of the bad guys, but you can acquire several different weapons later on. The game is pretty tough, as a top-down view of how you play it makes it difficult to aim your gun and judging the distance the bullets travel. The player has about four minutes before each of the six locks are opened in the vault, but can gain more time by destroying the main computer on the fourth floor. 
Once all the locks have been unlocked, the vault is now open and the game's final battle is triggered. The player has only a few minutes to get to the 30th floor for a final battle with Carl, Hans and any of the remaining terrorists. With many modern reviews look upon it now quite unfavourably, I think the game is generally quite good. There was also a game for the PC Engine, only released in Japan, exhibiting nice colourful graphics and big sprites, playing like Commando, which is not a bad thing. It's clear it just has the Die Hard license and they swapped around a few sections to make it resemble the movie, as there is barely any connection to it. It has you running around a forest and a river. That wasn't in the film. A typical lazy switcheroo with an already developed game and just rebadged it with a Die Hard title. In 1996 we got a game for the PlayStation, Saturn and PC from Probe Entertainment called Die Hard Trilogy, combining three different games into one. Alien Trilogy, also developed by Probe, proved successful as a formula to combine three movies into one game, but Die Hard makes great attempts to give you three different experiences instead of having all three mashed together. Now I've discussed this game before in my review of Die Hard with a Vengeance, and more recently it was featured in my top 10 video games based on movies list, covered by Slope's Game Room. Personally, I enjoyed the game based on the first movie. The other two games were perfectly fine, but I found myself being drawn back to the first one. Today it's certainly a clunky game, and not very easy on the eyes. But the gameplay is solid, and a lot of fun, and for the most part captures the spirit of the movie very well, despite taking a few liberties here and there. It's a tad repetitive as well, but good fun in short bursts. It doesn't feel like a full game, so to speak. It's certainly not a mini game, but it's clear it's been limited to fit on the disc with the other two titles. Still impressive though, having three full games on one CD. Here's an odd one for you on the Sega Saturn. Originally called Dynamite Decker in arcades, which paid homage to Die Hard, Sega decided to pay for the license to call it Die Hard Arcade for territories outside of Japan. The game arrived in 1997 for Sega's console. You play as a cop who bears a close resemblance to McLean, and he is joined by a female cop who are tasked with saving the president's daughter from a group of terrorists on a building very similar to Nakatomi Plaza. It's a brilliant Streets of Rage style game. I loved it back in the day when I had my Saturn. It's not too long and superb in two player mode. It has little connection to the movie, but certainly worth picking up if you're into retro gaming. And finally in 2002, we had Die Hard Nakatomi Plaza arriving on the PC published by Sierra Entertainment. A first person shooter that of course follows the movie, but expands the plot to throw in additional missions. The game received very mixed reviews when it came out. If you're a big fan of the movie, you may get some fun out of it but it's a pretty ugly game that doesn't really provide anything new to the genre. It's just a standard first person shooter with a die hard lick of paint. If I would recommend any of them, I would say the NES game and Die Hard Arcade. Despite its loose connection, it's a lot of fun to play. When Die Hard first came out, I was of course too young to see it in cinemas or even rent it. To be honest, I don't ever recall seeing it coming out in theaters never saw any adverts, and it was only till it was on VHS and TV during the Christmas period that it came to my attention. In the early 90s, Die Hard wasn't really a movie my friends and I talked much about. It never seemed to be on our radar. I think it was only the release of the sequels that the movie suddenly became this action movie you had to watch, and of course having Sky Satellite and the movie channels was a blessing, being able to watch these movies without having to get your parents to rent them for you. Die Hard brought us another side to the action hero, one that was vulnerable and showed us his weaknesses. Arnold and Sly both seemed to overcome the odds without little pressure. Sure Rambo got tortured, but it didn't really seem to bother him afterwards. He didn't really show much sign of wear and tear of battle. With John McClane he is in good shape, but does get badly beaten up and his foot cut up by glass and by the end he is a total mess as he faces up against Hans Gruber. This was a major change of direction for the action hero. In most movies they would often take on an entire army of men by themselves and come out with just a flesh wound. It made the genre unrealistic to many critics, despite the level of enjoyment being high, it made many people laugh at how silly the genre was becoming. Die Hard made great attempts to bring it back to a sense of reality and have the hero be a normal person who has to face this difficult task by himself, but ultimately makes mistakes along the way to save the day. McLean is a character that doesn't really like himself. He is short tempered and says the wrong thing as he lets his emotions get the better of him. Despite these shortcomings, he is a very good natured person at heart and is dedicated to his job. He wants to help people and do the right thing, but his personal life and relationship with his wife is a challenge for him to maintain demonstrating he's too dedicated to his job. This made the character of John McLean quite relatable to many people. 
I do really miss the days when Bruce Willis was happy to be acting and was really giving his all to a part. Die Hard was of course early on and his first big feature, so he had something to prove to the world. Bruce is at his best when he is being a smart ass, and the character of McLean fits so well with his personality. He was known for comedy and then jumping into action was a big step, which to his credit showed he could do it and it changed his career from then on, and he starred in dozens of action films. Alan Rickman for his first feature film role, he knocked it out of the park. His performance is so controlled and often theatrical when needed, certainly not as over the top as his performance in Robin Hood as the Sheriff of Nottingham, but his delivery of his lines was so encapsulating, his role as Gruber just stuck in your memory. The decision to make him a professional thief rather than a terrorist I think was the right move. Despite him being the bad guy, he is not truly heartless. He shows sympathy for the hostages and won't just kill people for the sake of it. This makes him somewhat a likeable character and you end up really enjoying the scenes when he is on camera, making him the best villain of the Die Hard series. I think for many actors who came on board for the sequels, must have felt a huge pressure to live up to Rickman's performance. Die Hard is now a firm favourite for Christmas viewing. Its setting, its use of music and the hero McLean joining his wife for the festive season, these are easy comparisons to make in saying it's a Christmas film. Now I don't personally think it's a Christmas film in a traditional sense. Fox didn't seem to think so as it was released in the summer and after Christmas in other countries in early 1989. Shane Black often sets his movies at Christmas, but people don't often jump to say they are Christmas movies. I find the whole discussion on if it's a Christmas film or not kind of redundant. I personally watch The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings trilogies every Christmas. These certainly aren't festive movies for the season, but are now part of my yearly viewing. So whatever film gets you in the festive spirit is all good in my book. The premise of the film and how it's executed is brilliant. For a movie with many script rewrites and dialogue being changed often on the day of shooting, the film should be a mess, but it's not, it's far from it. The production was lucky to have talented filmmakers at a point in their career where they probably didn't realise how good they were, with improvising many scenes on the spot in attempts to fix the script. With its many last minute changes, it could have been a total disaster. John McTiernan and cameraman Jan Dubont, who later went on to be a successful director in his own right, do a superb job of capturing the geography of the building, really helping the audience take in what's on each floor and how everything fits around the locations, giving you a great sense of what's going on. John uses traditional techniques to set up each scene, which is a trick many modern filmmakers seem to forget about. It's always the tried and tested tricks of the trade that help tell a story visually. The overall look of the movie has this warm mix of oranges and reds, and once night falls, it has metallic blues of the building coming to play. It's a movie that is wonderfully painted with light and is so slick in its presentation. I think 90% of the film is bang on solid and is pretty flawless, but I do have similar issues Roger Ebert raised with the film, not as extreme as his, but the cops who turn up to deal with Gruber and his men are portrayed as incompetent fools. It does dilute its overall quality somewhat. The movie strikes for the most part a serious tone with some comedic flourishes, but it becomes borderline a comedy and frustrating when the cops and the FBI are just played for total dicks. You could have the FBI being overly confident fools, but the majority of the police assisting excluding Powell are so unhelpful and aggressive towards McLean. It's like they fail to listen to what's going on and feel they can easily handle the situation but at the end costing people their lives. The film does have a nice layer of cheese at the end when John and Powell meet for the first time face to face and when Powell redeems himself by shooting Carl. But I suppose in keeping with the Christmas spirit, Christmas movies always need a good layer of cheddar to make you smile or put you in a good mood. John's wife Holly sadly I think is kind of wasted. Bonnie is a talented actor but doesn't have much time to shine. She gets her moments to show her independent nature when arguing with her husband and showing she can stand up to Hans Gruber, but she spends the majority of the movie just sitting down with nothing to do. In Die Hard 2, yet again, she spends the entire movie sitting on a plane. This is not really a major issue, but I think more could have been done to include more of his wife and show that she could have also helped McLean in some way. Die Hard demonstrated how talented Bruce Willis was as a leading man, and further reinforced that director John McTiernan was a great action director with a strong skill set and a great knowledge of how to tell a story visually. Die Hard is still a strong contender to be one of the best action films of the 80s and has a strong following to this day as it's now 30 years old. With all the sequels, the first movie is still considered the best out of the franchise, with Die Hard with a Vengeance coming close for me as a personal favourite. The film has stood the test of time and is extremely rewatchable. 
The film is a combination of great talents early on in their career coming together to deliver a solid action film for the summer, and they succeeded on all fronts. Well, the best, the best way we can figure it is we've got maybe 30 or 35 hostages up there, probably on the 30th floor, and maybe, uh, well, I don't know, seven or eight terrorists up there. Sounds like an A7 scenario. Thank you. We'll handle it from here. When we come into your men, we'll try and let you know. What about John McClain? He's the reason why we have the information we have up until now. He's also the reason why you're facing seven terrorists instead of 12. He's inside? Who is he? Well, he might be a cop. I don't know. We're checking on that. One of yours? No, no way. Pal. Yo, pal, you got a minute? I'm here, John. I want you to do something for me. Um, <clears throat> I want you to find my wife. Don't ask me how, by then you'll know how. Uh, I want you to tell her something. I want you to tell her that. I told her it took me a while to figure out uh, what a jerk I've been. But, um, that. Tell her that, um, that she's the best thing that ever happened to a bum like me. She's heard me say I love you a thousand times. She never heard me say I'm sorry. After all your posturing, all your little speeches, you're nothing but a common thief. I'm an exceptional thief. Mrs. McLean, and since I'm moving up to kidnapping, you should be more polite. Pal, pal, listen to me, it's a double cross, the whole roof of the building fired! John, come in. Did you get that? Nah, uh, something about a double cross. If you missed out on our Kickstarter to help fund my first feature-length documentary, In Search of the Last Action Heroes, don't worry, all our fantastic and exclusive awards are now available on Indiegogo In Demand. You can find a link below.